And as you said, you didn't know how you sounded. You sang beautifully. And Courtney signed beautifully. And we thank you. Congratulations to the Clemson Tigers. Even if you're not a sports fan, surely you know what I'm talking about. They're the reigning national champions of college football as of last Monday night in Tampa. And that touchdown pass that Deshaun Watson threw to Hunter Renfro to win the game not only clinched that victory, but was the 41st touchdown pass of the season for Deshaun Watson, breaking the single-season ACC record set by Jameis Winston. Quite an accomplishment. Now, I'm well aware, as I say this this morning, there are a lot of Clemson fans in this church. I'm also well aware that there are some avid Alabama fans in this church. And I want to be respectful to both. I will say to you that the win Monday night was the first time that Clemson has beaten Alabama head-to-head -head in the last 14 meetings. Now, Clemson did beat Alabama in 1900. And a few times around there. And by the way, in 1900, you know who the Clemson coach was? John Heisman for whom the Heisman Trophy is named. But congratulations to the Tiger fans here in the congregation and to Deshaun Watson and Hunter Renfro and to the local connections, Carlos Watkins and Jay Guillermo. But I want to say all that to you this morning to say this. In any game like that, think about, if you will, all the unsung heroes. And maybe Hunter Renfro's one of those. He was a walk-on at Clemson. Pretty amazing. And caught two touchdown passes, I believe, in that game. But think about all the unsung heroes. Think about all the players and all the coaches that we seldom hear about Work behind the scenes, work every day to make a victory like that possible. Pretty amazing, really. And this morning, in the next few Sundays, we want to talk about some unsung heroes in the Bible. Some of the lesser knowns who teach us great truths. We're not going to talk about so much about Paul and Peter and David and Moses. But some people, maybe you've heard of them, but lesser knowns who teach us great lessons about life. Today, Titus. And what do you know about Titus? Well, he did get a book. Over near the end of the New Testament, three chapters, 46 verses, right after First and Second Timothy, but that was written by the Apostle Paul. What do you know about Titus? Anything? Titus was a Greek. He did not know the God of the Bible. He heard a man named Paul preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and Titus became a believer. So much so that Paul took Titus, this is interesting to me, Paul took Titus as his object lesson to Jerusalem and said to the apostles, and said to the Jewish believers, here's a guy who doesn't know the law, here's a guy that's not been circumcised, and he's a Christian, and he's genuine, and he's real. He's a believer. And Titus became Paul's son in the ministry. In time, Titus went with Paul to Ephesus and Corinth, but most of his work was on a little island called Crete. There were no churches. And Titus worked, and Paul worked, and they started churches on Crete. But the people had no clue what to do. They had no clue how to be good. They had no clue how to follow Christ. And Titus taught them. And so Titus. What we really want you to see this morning is what he was made of. His character. And Paul speaks to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. First of all, he was empathetic. Empathetic. 
Paul says in verse 16, I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. Paul was empathetic, and he says Titus was empathetic. Now, what's that mean? It means to have a heart. It means to feel for each other. It means to see each other. Empathy means that I don't look past you. I don't look around you. I don't look over you. I look at you eyeball to eyeball, and I feel for you, and I understand you. That's empathy, right? And that's what Paul says about Timothy, that he had empathy. So many times, so many of us are in a hurry in our relationships, and we don't listen, and we look past people. Empathy means we have a heart. We have a concern. We try to walk in the other person's shoes. Um, a couple weeks ago on a Friday, actually the Friday that we had that snowstorm that night, uh, we'd gone to Charlotte. Allison had an eye doctor's appointment. We've been in this office many times. We're sitting in the lobby waiting for her appointment. And uh, this couple, older couple, comes in. And uh, the uh, lady had to go to the restroom. She told her husband to take a seat. And uh, he did. He almost sat in the plant. Finally, he got in the chair. And uh, we later learned that his name was Shorty. And I'm not making fun of anybody, but it was a fitting name because when he sat down in the chair, his feet didn't even touch the floor. But this lady and Shorty started talking to us and talking to us and talking to us and talking to us. So much so, I'm sitting there thinking inside, I surely wish they would call them back. You understand what I'm saying? I surely wish they would call them back. But they kept talking. We found out she was a cancer survivor. We found out that he had had eye surgery. It did not go well. Therefore, they were at the eye doctor, hoping this eye doctor could help them. We found out that Shorty had been in the fire department 40 or 50 years. We found out they were very active in the gospel Light Baptist Church, and they loved their preacher. And, hey, by the way, they said their preacher preached at 2 o'clock. Aren't you glad I'm your preacher? <laughs> but they were excited about their church and excited about their preacher. But when they were called back finally, not only had Shorty almost missed the chair and sat in the plant, he took his wife's arm, and as they walked back, he ran into the door frame. He could not see. And I went in those moments from wishing they would have called him back sooner to feeling empathy for my new acquaintance. Another example of empathy that I would give to you, maybe not the best example, was years ago in our first church. Uh, I was young, dumb, and stupid. You ever been there? Uh, Rhonda was young and smart and beautiful, still is. Um, and I was up at the furniture store one day, and I've told this before. Some of you remember my story. I saw this love seat, and it grabbed me, and I said, I'm going to buy that for I didn't have any money. I said, I'm going I'm to I'm somehow get the money. I'm going to buy that love seat for my wife, a love seat. I was so excited. So I, I, I purchased this love seat, and I talked to him about delivering it to our house. And you know, I was surprised Rhonda kept it from her. Didn't tell her the big day came. Delivery truck pulls up. And, you know, I can't hardly contain my excitement. And they come in. They unload the love seat. They bring it in the den. And I take one look at her, and I know she hates it. I said, she didn't say a word. I knew she hated it. And I swallowed my pride and called the furniture store even before the delivery guys got back. And we're talking about a mile up the road. And said, would you please come and get it and take it back to the store? It's not going to work in our den. But she hated it. Now what happened there? I tried to cast my thoughts and my wishes and my whims on my wife. I didn't understand her. And so much of marriage is empathy. So much of marriage is trying to understand the other person. But empathy, where we have a heart, where we try to walk in the other person's shoes. Titus was empathetic. Secondly, when we look at Titus, he was enthusiastic. Now Paul says, I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much what? You got your Bible open? With much enthusiasm. Paul says of Titus, he's empathetic, but he's coming to you with much enthusiasm. Now what is enthusiasm? It's excitement, 
right? It's an intense feeling. Enthusiasm is where we have a fire, we have a glow, we're gung-ho about something, right? Now, I hope this new year is 15 days old. I hope you're excited about 2017. I hope you're excited about your walk with Christ and where you are. I hope you're excited about your church and your Sunday school class and upward, a new upward season in Sunday school. And if you're not, I pray God will get you excited. I hope you're excited about your home and your family and your marriage and your friends and your work. And if you're not, I pray God will get you excited. I hope you're excited about new chapters and new opportunities in life. And let me say something to you. I know we all have struggles. We all have challenges. But the successful people I've met in life who are enthusiastic are enthusiastic in and through their challenges. So many of us wait around... We waiting for the time in life when everything's good. Let me tell you something. That time's not coming. That time's not coming. We all have troubles. Enthusiasm is there in and through our troubles. And guess what? Enthusiasm's contagious. It's catching. It spreads. And so does frowning. You gonna smile at me? Enthusiasm is contagious. It spreads. It catches. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, enthusiasm is one of the most powerful engines of success. When you do a thing, do it with your might. Put your whole soul into it. Stamp it with your personality. Be active. Be energetic. Be enthusiastic and faithful and you will accomplish your object. Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. My prayer is that you're enthusiastic about your walk with God and about His amazing grace. And if you're not, that you will be. That God will get you excited and give you a fire deep in your soul. Steve Lyons. Anybody know Steve Lyons? These are, this is sports day, okay? Anybody know Steve Lyons? He played for the Chicago White Sox in the 90s. And uh, Steve Lyons was probably just an average baseball player who did above average things. He was a fan favorite because if somebody in the stands caught a foul ball and he could get to them, he'd go over and high-five them. He was a fan favorite. But one day, the Chicago White Sox were playing the Detroit Tigers. And Steve Lyons bunted the ball and he raced down the first baseline. He knew the play was going to be close, and he dove into first base, and he was safe. An argument ensued between the Detroit pitcher and the umpire, and Steve Lyons went over to put his two cents worth in, and he felt dirt running down his legs where he had dove into first base. So he dropped his drawers. He dropped his britches. Let me get on this side so I can demonstrate. He dropped his britches. And the women started waving dollar bills. <laughs> and he got seven TV interviews and 25 radio interviews. Now he did have on his sliding pants, okay? So instead of it being R, it was PG-13. But here's what I want to say to you. I want to salute somebody that'll race down first base, that'll hustle, that'll know it's going to be close, that'll dive into first base. I want to salute their enthusiasm. Would to God that the people called Christians in the church would have that kind of enthusiasm about our walk with Christ and about the church and about our lives. Enthusiasm. Titus was enthusiastic. It's interesting to me that Paul points that out. Thirdly, he was eager. I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you, empathy. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he's coming to you with much enthusiasm. 
and on his own initiative. He was eager. The root word of initiative is initiate. What's that mean? It means to step out, step up. Initiate means that we're self-starters. We don't have to have somebody telling us what to do. Initiate means that uh, we get up and get going. Initiate means that we're ready to go for God and ready to go to work. Eager. Eager. I've never been really crazy about New Year's resolutions. I don't know whether you are or not. I'm more crazy about us making heartfelt commitments, being eager. But over the years, I have seen some people, at the beginning of a new year, make some commitments to God and to the church and stick with them. And what a blessing that is. I have seen people... Make use the new year as a time of renewal and a time of revival. And make commitments to God and make commitments to the church and stick with those. You know, one of you in here this morning was telling me recently about the gym. You know, the, the, right now you can't get in the gym, can you? Gym's packed out in January, it always is. People at Christmas and around New Year's, they make these commitments. They're going to get in shape, they're going to lose weight, they get a gym membership. Gym's packed out. But what happens? Wait to February. Right? Or March for sure. And it'll be the same old crowd. Is that true? Is that the gospel? Hopefully we are eager in our prayer lives, in our devotional lives, in our service. And you know what it means? It means simply saying, God, here I am. What the choir sings, God? Here I am to worship. God, here I am. Here I am. Do with me as you see fit. Eager. Maybe you heard the story of the ministers and the sales people that were having conventions, different areas, but conventions in the same hotel, same caterer, same chef, and the salesmen at the conclusion of their meal, they were going to have spiked watermelon. But there was a mix-up. And that spiked watermelon went to the ministers. And the chef realized it, and he panicked. And he said to one of the waiters, Go, now, get it. He said, It's too late. They're already enjoying the watermelon. And the chef said, Well, do they like it? And the waiter said, I don't know if they like it or not, but they're putting the seeds in their pockets. They were eager, weren't they? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get drunk on something. I want you to get drunk on the Holy Spirit of God and not let anyone or anything this year quench your relationship with the Lord. Titus, I love Titus. He was empathetic, enthusiastic, and eager to serve. I started off this morning talking about Clemson. You Clemson fans sitting out there, I hope you've written a thank you note to Alabama. If you haven't, you need to. Frank Howard, the legendary coach of Clemson, played at Alabama. Danny Ford, the next legendary coach at Clemson, played at Alabama. And Dabo Sweeney, the new legendary coach of Clemson, played at Alabama. So write your thank you notes. I'm teasing. Hey. 
Hunter Renfro, anybody that's an unsung hero, lesser knowns who teach us great truths, think about Titus. Think about Titus and the challenge to be empathetic and enthusiastic and eager. Will you pray with me this morning? Lord, give us a heart for people this year. A heart for people. Lord, give us a newfound enthusiasm. Get us out of our ruts. And Lord, help us to be eager to say to you, here I am, Lord. Use me and send me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn today is 491, Jesus I Come. What a great hymn. And we invite you to stand and to sing and to come as God leads you, as God leads me. We're going to sing together 491, Jesus I Come. <laughs>